right, everyone. I think we got uh, the majority of the folks um, who had registered have now officially joined. So I want to welcome everyone to the uh, April 8, uh, 22 at Tech Committee meeting. We have the complete list of registrants, uh, including the fact that we have a quorum today to act. So in terms of uh, this introductions item, the only thing I want to do is remind everyone when you are making a motion or a second, um, please identify yourself. It makes it a little bit easier for us to catch that uh, for the minute. So we appreciate that. Um, but with with that, I will move on into meeting minutes. And the first thing we have is the tech committee meeting minutes from the 11th of February. So I'll bring them up on the screen and I will ask if there are any comments or if there's a motion for action on the minutes. Steve, this Steve is Steve Lippard, Dalton County. I move to approve the minutes. Thank you, Mr. Libhart. Is there this, a second? This is Kirk, I'll second. Thank you, Kirk. Any further discussion on the minutes? All in favor of the motion, aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Also in your packet of materials are the minutes from the coordinating committee meeting at the end of February. Any questions or, or comments on the coordinating committee minutes? Hearing nothing, we will move to administrative modifications. And I will go to the map um, and ask, I don't know if it's Nate or Jonathan, whoever's uh, going to run us through the administrative measures. You want to identify the name of the project and anything you want to highlight for us. Appreciate it. Uh, it's going to be May, Steve. I'll okay. uh, run through. So since the last tech meeting, there were 36 actions. Two of them were cash flows, 24 increases, decreases, and 10 changing of the funding sources. Uh, some projects I'm going to identify are item 58, Big Spring Road resurfacing. Uh, this is a new start project. This is also going to be on the draft tip. This is on the draft tip. Item 60, Schaefer's Valley Road resurfacing. Item 62, Fishburn Road resurfacing. And item 64, one up bottom, bottom resurfacing. These are all new start projects that are on the draft tip. We're just starting them early. So that's um that's all I have for a minute. Well, I also have uh that the round two of the infrastructure improvement jobs acts were approved. The funds went into the line item, and these funds will be used for estimate and low bid increases. That's all I have for administrative modifications. If you have any questions. Anybody have any questions on the administrative actions? Okay, and John, I, I think we're, we don't have any uh, amendments this time around, do we? No, not that I saw either, yep. They're all okay. Then does anybody have any questions on the administrative actions there for your information? All right. Thank you very much. I think that takes us then down to bike ped update. And with that, I have Mr. Bomberger here. Thank you, Chairman. Um so I have a couple things to go over since we last uh, met. We, we talked at the last meeting about our, our restarting of what was the Harrisburg bike share. It is now going to 
hopefully evolve into a kind of a more regional uh, bike share. We distributed an RFI, it was due mid-March. We received five submissions. We reviewed those five submissions internally and met with our steering and stakeholder committee and developed the consensus on how to move forward. Steve's kind of showing on screen, we put together a, a, a quick kind of summary of, of each submission, as well as a, a paragraph we just met yesterday with the steering committee to kind of discuss how to move forward. It was decided that Tandem was the most responsive and the best able to implement the system as we envisioned. Uh, and the plan is to move forward with more detailed discussions and negotiations with Tandem Mobility to, at this point, essentially restart the Harrisburg bike share in its most recent form with that an eye towards expanding, uh, you know, to, to other places in the, in the region, you know, as, as we get comfortable with, with the operation of the, of the bike share. And if you remember, we have, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have CMAC funding on the current tip, and then we have CMAC funding uh, moving forward uh, throughout all four years of the draft tip. We've been in discussion with PennDOT and FHWA on exactly how, how we can use that CMAC. Uh, obviously, we're hoping to maximize that, that funding source's use, but then we've also been in some preliminary discussions with some sponsors to fill any gaps that would be that we would need uh, to fill. So that's where we are with bike share. Does anybody have any questions on bike share? Yeah, I'll just Sorry, Steve, do you have any? Yeah, I'll just I'll just toss in there. I think a couple of the key things here where I think tandem mobility was as affordable for users as any of the submissions that we received. Um, and most um, responsive in that desire to be able to connect not only a, a Harrisburg based system, but other kind of nodes in our region. I'll, I'll just pretend potentially mention Mechanicsburg, Carlisle, Middletown, Newport, you know, a range of places, but also the other systems that are in the region, uh, Hershey and uh, Lancaster at this point have systems. So they, they were the most able um, or most detailed in terms of what they could do to connect all of those systems together. So in essence, eventually, you know, hope, the hope is this becomes a kind of a South Central Pennsylvania uh, bike share. So wherever you are, uh, if you're a member, you can join up and ride. Yeah, and, and through through this, through the tandem program, you know, it, you kind of see on the user cost uh, in the chart, it's essentially $30 a year. And if you don't ever ride the bike for more than an hour at a time, you it's $30 a year and that's it. So that if you scroll down through, that is significantly cheaper than a lot of the other ones. So that combined with like Steve said, they, they actually have a tandem has implemented a system out, I think in, in Kansas and in, in kind of a, a couple of rural communities in Kansas that aren't necessarily connected, but have, you know, multi, I think it's five kind of hubs that all operate as the same system. And that's, I think, very similar to what, what we, at least an aspect of what we want to see this, this for, because I don't know that we're anticipating people, you know, riding a, riding a bike share from Perry County down to Harrisburg, but we certainly want to enable the communities in Perry County, uh, to take advantage and implement some sort of bike share, even if it's just kind of an internal to the to the community. All right, I I see Mr. Epstein has a hand raised, so I'll go to you first, assuming you have a question or comment on bike share. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, now you're now you're unmuted. We can hear you. Thanks. And Andrew, I don't know if this is germane, but I noticed, uh, for instance, at the new property at Progress in Lingelstown, there's a bike lane that's kind of orphaned. It goes nowhere. And I'm just wondering if there's a study or a move out to either connect those um, existing bike routes or to make them more localized. For instance, that route could go to the 
a couple malls nearby at Blue Ridge or at, uh, in the old uh, Oak Mall at Susquehanna. I, I guess what I'm wondering is, is there any studies out there to utilize what we already have? Um, and you and I participated in the Route 39743 study, and there was a lot of interest for uh, bike transportation. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question that leads right into my next, um, I, I guess I'll, I'll say, give me a minute to ask if anybody else has any specific bike share questions, because I'll be answering that, your question in a second. So if there's no other bike share questions, or if you have if you have a question or a comment about bike share, feel free to reach out to me or Steve or even Lauren uh, Weaver in our office, who's also been working a lot on, on the bike share. Uh, but Eric, to answer your question, the next thing I want to talk about, we're, we're uh, in the early stages of, of developing an active transportation plan that would do just that. Um, we submitted a DCNR grant application this week. Uh, the active transportation plan, essentially our idea, you know, our goal will be to combine and validate a lot of the work that's already been done, both by us, by local communities, by PennDOT, um, at, at the regional and local level, and then kind of further develop, you know, in our RTP, what we have what we call our regional backbone, which kind of identifies the most important uh, routes for, for non-motorized connectivity. We want to kind of take that a, a step further, make some recommendations on, on facilities where appropriate and kind of identify uh, some off-road trails um, as appropriate um, and kind of combine those together to, to kind of have a, a, just an improved regional backbone. We anticipate working, you know, our, I think our goal is to have this done by the end of next year. So, um, you'll certainly be hearing a lot more about that. Andrew, thank you. That answers the question. I was just asking for selfish reasons, because if you could do that localized plan, um, you could possibly have a bike route back to Sportsman's into the Boyd Center and combine uh, bike, transportation, uh, bike transportation with regional recreation. But I'll follow up with you. Sure, and I and I I know PennDOT would would uh, echo my the comment I'm about to make is that kind of the most important partner in that is all is the municipality because they they would be any any bike facility ongoing maintenance is a even if it's on a PennDOT road ongoing maintenance is the responsibility of the municipality so there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of people need to be pushing in the same direction to. to implement what you're, what you're talking about, which is what kind of exactly what we want to do with this active transportation plan. Thanks, that answers my question. And then the last thing I have on, if there's any other, if, if there's any questions for active transportation, uh, now feel free, if not, again, feel free to follow up with me or, or Steve or Lauren. Um, the last thing I'll mention is, is we've got our spring bike counts coming up. They are taking place May 15th through the 21st. Uh, you know, I, as, as always, it's, it's five days that week, Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Saturday. Uh, we have 21 locations. All the links and information are available on our bike planning webpage, which is accessible through the link in, our, in the supplemental info uh, memo that I that's right after the agenda in the meeting packet. Um, if you have any questions or interest, please contact me. That's all I have, unless anybody has any questions. Anything for Andrew before we move on? Hearing nothing, we will go down to operations and safety, and I will turn you over to Mr. Snyder. Thanks, Steve. Uh, good morning, everyone. A few updates today. Uh, first, I'll start with uh, kind of an update on our HSIP project selection process that we have. Uh, we have a memo for that as well. Um, but we, this past fall, we contracted with Kittleson and Associates um, to help us with some HSIP project selection work. So HSIP, which is the Highway Safety Improvement Program, is a federal transportation program. Uh, and the objective of that program is to reduce traffic fatalities and serious injuries on public roadways. Um, and 
as with other federal transportation uh, programs, it's heavily data driven and performance based. Um, so in order to have eligible projects, the project must be safety based and also um, pass a benefit cost ratio. Um, and this is calculated through the project cost and the disbenefit, which is the basically the economic impact that crashes at that location have. And that's how the benefit cost ratios are calculated. Um, but we contracted with Kittleson since they do a lot of work with uh, PennDOT on their HSIP program and the highway, um, highway safety manual network screening tool that they, uh, the department puts out. So we contracted with them this past fall and they analyzed our programmed, planned, and uh, project pipeline uh, projects uh, in order to determine uh, which ones could be HSIP eligible and then perform uh, the benefit cost ratio calculations as part of the application. So uh, in total, Kittleson evaluated 39 projects that HATS had. Um, they did it according to the HSM kind of uh, methodology. They used PennDOT crash data, road geometry data, and they used PennDOT's um, online traffic information repository. Uh, to conduct these analyses. So uh, there's six total projects that they identified. Uh, the Capitol Gateway Project in Dolphin County, 21st Street and Center Street in Cumberland, Cal um, Cumberland County, Derry Street in Dolphin County, Eisenhower Boulevard in Dolphin County, Paxton and Sycamore Intersection in Dolphin County, and State Route 34 in Perry County. <clears throat> and what they also did was they basically did a breakdown of the number of intersections involved in each project, the number of segments, and they also calculated the number of sub projects for each project. So basically they, the entire project may not be um, past that benefit cost ratio, but you can break out different parts to have eligible kind of subsections of each project. So that's what's on the screen now are the sub projects and their corresponding benefit cost ratios. So of the 10 sub projects that Kilson identified, we have six with a positive benefit cost ratio and four that do not pass um, either due to high project costs or low um, kind of disbenefit values. So um, this is a really nice step in the right direction because historically each SIP has been one of the hardest uh, funding sources for HATS to utilize for project funding. So we're pretty excited about the prospects of being able to continue these conversations with the department and the district and uh, keep these projects moving forward. Yeah, so we've supplied this to the district to supplement the work that they did looking for the outcomes, but it looks very promising, I think, at this point. Okay. So any initial questions about that before I move on to my next topic? Okay, hearing none. Um, so next we have our Waze Regional uh, Data Sharing Program. So we are Waze for Cities partners, and as part of that, we can share data back to Waze. So we've partnered with a vendor um, called Navjoy, based out of Colorado, and we have built a regional platform for municipalities to sign up, and then um, we will create kind of their personalized access, and they can then share uh, road closure data um, online. It's pretty easy and seamless. And then uh, we will aggregate that through the entire region and send it back to Waze. So um, anyone who uses the Waze navigation app on their phone um, as they're driving, and if there's a road closure along the route, uh, they'll be automatically notified. So um, I believe we're the first ones within the Commonwealth to be doing this. And we already have a few municipalities signed up, which is pretty exciting. Um, we're going to be working on some educational materials and continuing kind of conducting some municipal outreach. Um, our goal is to get as many participants as um, possible. And this is an absolutely free program for municipalities. All they have to do is just um, contact us for more information. We have a real quick um, you know, data sharing agreement. It's real simple. You just sign it and provide points of contact and give that back to us. We'll give you online access and you're good to go. Um, any questions about the Waze data sharing program that we have? Okay, uh, and then finally, my last point is our regional congestion management process. Uh, we're working on doing an update to our 2017 CMP, uh, but we are looking to do a different approach this time. We're looking to do more of a real-time data-driven approach 
Um, so instead of calculating the static data sample, it'll rely on uh, probe data um, and be kind of put into an online dashboard, which gives us the opportunity to really focus on what's happening in real time and make the decisions based on that. So if there's any significant shifts in traffic patterns, like what we saw from COVID, um, you know, that's something that we can see in real time. And then also if we make improvements to giving corridors, uh, we can also um, see the improvements in real time as well. So it really gives us the opportunity to create a true congestion management process instead of a static plan. Um, so we are actually having a conversation with central office uh, next Wednesday to continue the conversation. And our goal is to also help participate in a regionalized CMP um, at the district eight level. So we're continuing those conversations and uh, pretty excited about the process of that. So any operations or safety related questions for Kyle? Hearing none that moves us down to tip development. And for that, I'll turn you back to <coughs> Mr. Bomberger. Thank you. Uh, at our February meetings, the HATS committees voted to forward the draft tip to AQ conformity. Um, so that happened. The next step in the process is to move on to the public comment period. Uh, our public comment period will run from May 2nd to June 2nd. Uh, Within that time frame, we have a, a public meeting, our, our required kind of in-person public meeting scheduled for May 11th from 11 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. in Strawberry Square. We're also going to do, uh, similar to what we did with the RTP, uh, two different kind of public information sessions virtually through, through Zoom. So one will be on May 17th from, from 12, from noon to one. Uh, and the next one will be May 19th from 6 to 7 p.m. So both of those will then be recorded and, and uploaded and accessible to people who missed, uh, who, who were unable to attend, and we'll have contact information within that so the people that have questions based on that can get in touch with us. We will also be doing extensive social media and online outreach utilizing our GIS story map, which everybody, you know, it. it a very good resource. Everybody seems to engage well with that. Um, we anticipate receiving our AQ conformity report later this month. We have to have it by the time we go to public comment. I've been in, in contact with the consultant uh, that we should be we should be fine with that. Um, and I will say that our our scheduled public comment period is is. Uh, we are good with, with, with the time frame to be able to have all the public comments to this committee before we ask for official action on the, on the tip, avoiding what happened last time. Um, so uh, once we receive that AQ conformity report later this month, we'll share it with the committees. Uh, we can't move forward in the process if the program doesn't pass a air quality conformity, but that historically hasn't been much of an issue. Um, so, I, so today we're asking for a recommendation to move to, to the coordinating committee to move us on to the public comment period, contingent on us passing that AQ conformity analysis. Um, but basically just the, the next step in the process. Okay, so before I ask for a, a motion um, as was suggested by Andrew, does anybody have any questions for him um, related to the the tip itself or where we are on the tip development process. Hearing none, I think he was looking for a, a motion to move to public comment um, subject to having received the air quality conformity analysis in advance. Is there such a motion? Steve, this is Kirk, I'll make that motion. Thank you, Kirk. Is there a second? <clears throat> Gary Eby, I'll, second. I'll make that. I'll oh, make a second. I got. I have Gary Eby on that one. Sorry, uh -huh. Jimmy. He, he beat you to it. <laughs> but with with that, any further as long comments? As it gets passed. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all right. All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, that then gets us to RTP implementation grant program and back to Mr. Bomberger again. Thanks. Uh, I, I am going to jump around here a little bit, as you can see, kind of under the funded studies on the on the uh, agenda. We have Capital Gateway. Um, I'm going to pull that up and because it's kind of germane to this conversation. So we received a request from Harrisburg City for a funding increase of approximately uh, 267,000. Essentially, the the these they're necessitated by design changes that, for, that came up during the safety review process that were largely not foreseeable during the application process. So um, we have Gene Che back on, I think, I think I saw Jeff Knight on. I, if either of them have anything to add to that, I think, you know, we, we had a similar request for Camp Hill at the last round of meetings. I think we'd, we'd, we'd be comfortable, you know, the, I think we want to have action on this just so that everybody's comfortable with, with the changes moving forward. Good morning, Andrew. Good this is Gene Chay back with, with Larson. Yes. Uh, what, what caused the change here was was a comment made during the safety review process. And basically what happened was it changed the uh, the milling limits, uh, milling overlay limits for the project that go all the way back to the bridge deck for Harvey Taylor. Um, and as you can imagine, with uh, with that increase and the cost of bituminous and some additional curbing, uh, that's what necessitated that increase in cost. Like I said, it was something that was unforeseen during the initial application process several years ago. So. Uh, and I, I just highlighted that section at the bottom of the page that the city is saying that they understand that they're going to uh, have to uh, account for 20% of that cost increase so that we maintain that 80-20 split uh, with the grant local match. So any, any questions for Gene or Andrew on uh, kind of the need for this uh, cost increase for the RTP project? The only other thing I'll note is this is one of the projects that Kittleson looked at as potentially a portion of it being able to be funded by HSIP. Um, so I'll just, you know, the, the final mix of funding on this could be a little different even than what was originally anticipated. But with that, any questions? All right, so I think we would be looking for a motion to recommend um, accounting for this increase uh, in cost as indicated on the letter uh, in the packet. Jim Zimborski, I'll make that motion. Thank you, Jim. Is there a second? Steve Lidbart, I'll second. Thank you, Steve. Any further questions, comments on this? All right, all, all in favor, aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Thank you very much. So that still gets us back to RTP implementation so, with Andrew. So we, we've talked in past meetings about opening up another round of that. So we're preparing for that. We have some, we're making some what I would call minor tweaks to the program. Uh, th those minor tweaks are essentially establishing a minimum project size. Uh, we don't want to make this too large. I think right now we're thinking $100,000 for a construction project. Um, but there certainly is a, you know, we want to accommodate those smaller projects that typically are, are overlooked in the TIP development process. But there is, a, there is a cutoff at which a project is too low to really reap the benefits and, and, and you know, and make it worth going through all of the federal regulations and process. Uh, to implement. So um, we're, we're looking at probably 100,000 for that. And I think all but two or three of our applicants on that last round would have, uh, that only would have been an issue for one or two projects, I think. Um, another revision we're looking at is requiring the construction phase. So uh, you could, we had one applicant that came through uh, and was approved for only the design phase at the time. I think we want to make sure, you know, if, if we're going to select and, and fund a project, we want to make sure 
that it's moving the whole way through the process to construction. If there's questions about feasibility on the front end that they're un, unsure of what the final kind of construction number will be, I think we're gonna kind of push that back onto the municipality and require them to do some feasibility work before they apply through the process to make sure uh, you know, that everybody's kind of comfortable and willing to move forward as, as is necessary to, to complete the project. And then the last change um, is to address cost increases. Uh, so the, the idea is to, if, if you know, in, in the current guidelines, we say that cost increases are the responsibility of the applicant. We've now had two straight meetings where we had cost increases that are legitimate cost increases. And so we've accommodated them. So we kind of want to reflect that in the guidelines. And that if a cost increase comes through and it's, you know, if it's the result of changes that were brought about in the design and, and scoping process, then those are okay and will be covered under the program. If it's a cost increase that came through because the initial application was was kind of un underestimated or, or you know, for whatever reason, the application itself was wrong, the project didn't really change, but all of a sudden now they need significantly more money, that's gonna be the applicant responsibility. And to try to minimize or mitigate that, uh, Gene uh, Chabak, you know, offered some thoughts on the Harrisburg. He's from Larson Design. They've been helping the program projects kind of go through the process. We're also going to engage them on the front end of the process in the application uh, portion to at least give the applicant uh, each application a, a once over so that um, hopefully we can catch some of those issues uh, if, if more likely to catch them, you know, because this is also an issue on our we have, we have similar issues on our TAP projects as well. So I, I think having somebody with that kind of expertise look over the applications uh, only makes them better and, and a little bit easier once we, once we get into the programming and administrative side of the project. So there's a handful of other more technical items, but we, we think those, those kind of three things are the major changes. I, I think you know, the, the, the nature of the program, I don't think will really change it. It's really just changes to kind of help us out on the application and, and back end side. Shouldn't really affect the projects that get selected all that much. Um, for our thoughts on the next application round would be, uh, we'd op open up applications sometime in May. We'd wrap them up at, at the absolute latest by the end of July. That would give us August to review, evaluate, and meet with the RTP implementation work group to develop some, some recommendations on selection. And then we could come back to the HATS committees in September uh, for official selection, and they'd be able to move on to the TIP uh, basically right away. Uh, you know, the, the, the draft TIP that hopefully we will all be voting on in June will take effect October 1st. So if we vote in September, those will be able to be, you know, we'll, there shouldn't be any real delay in that process. So that's kind of our tentative schedule moving forward, obviously. Oh, and we've actually used, we've engaged uh, Larson to help us out with some, I'd say promotional material to uh, create a video that provides municipalities with a little background, a little information on, on what it means to, to go through the federal process and you know what kind of projects, when it's worth it, when it might not be kind of almost like a video frequently asked questions thing. So we're kind of working to, to finalize and develop that. That'll be part of our of our outreach uh, about for this application round. So if I'm understanding correctly, that you know that's a good overview of the kind of the program guideline changes that we're anticipating. I think we pull them together as a staff, maybe run them by the RTP work group sure. um, to make sure they're comfortable, have anything else to add. And then we're looking at this May timeframe for all this social media and announcements coming out that the grant round is, is open. Um, and then, like you said, uh, have a process that um, works itself through by the time we get to the September meeting so that we're 
good to go with the October fiscal year. Yeah, and, and that time frame will allow us to kind of take advantage of all the tip, the, the kind of required tip outreach we'll be doing. We'll be able to piggyback on that for the RTP implementation grant and kind of publicize them together. So I think in terms of action here, you're looking for a recommendation to complete those guideline updates, I'll call them, and uh, move towards an open application period here in the in the May time frame. Correct. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. Any questions on that from Andrew? Do we have a motion to support that recommendation to move the second round forward? Debbie Eller, I so move. Thank you, Debbie. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Ms. Kirk, I'll second. Thank you, Kirk. Any further questions, comments? Appreciate that. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, funded studies, I-81 improvement strategy. I, I think I gave you a very similar update last time. The, this project is nearing its completion. They are doing some updates to the website and to the project video to um, more effectively summarize the results of the effort that um, work should be done here in May. And uh, for, the, for the June meeting, I anticipate, We'll be able to share that information, I think, with the committees when that's complete and ready to go, give you a chance to look at it. But uh, what we'll be looking for then in June as part of that meeting uh, is to accept the 81 improvement strategy work basically as an addendum to the regional transportation plan. So um, look for some uh, outreach uh, materials on that between now and the next meeting and then Hopefully we'll be able to take action. Um, if you, you may remember, we already did have uh, some implementation uh, space on the TIP, current TIP. So we're already gonna be starting here in the design phase to start moving the recommendations of that effort um, forward. So I, I just wanna thank everybody that participated in that, you know, Federal Highways, PennDOT, um, and as, as well as the Franklin and Lebanon uh, MPOs that, that was, I think, a very effective effort that hopefully uh, ends up being an example for other MPOs how to do regional planning as it relates to priorities on an interstate. I think it came together nicely. So with that, any, any questions on 81? All right. I think the next item that's on the agenda, we already covered, well, correct? Unless Gene has any uh, updates on current. Yeah, projects. right. Okay, Gene, any, anything you want to say about the other dozen or so uh, RTP projects? Gene? Project. I'm showing you as muted, Gene. Okay. Well, if if Gene comes back before the end of the meeting, maybe under other business, we can have him uh, at any comments there. But my understanding is the projects are all moving forward as expected at this point. So um, with that, that'll I'll then go down to project development process project pipeline. Andrew, any updates on the pipeline? Yeah, we've actually had two submissions, both from Middlesex Township in Cumberland County. Uh, one was for an intersection at Middlesex and Trindle, which is actually uh, one of the potential HCIP projects that the district brought forward and is already programmed on the draft tip. Uh, the other is for Harrisburg Pike and Wolfsbridge Road, uh, again, some kind of intersection congestion improvements. We'll be this. We'll be coordinating with the with the uh, municipality moving forward. If everybody's kind of on the same page, that'll get added to the project pipeline, and and you know that and and uh, kind of move through that process. So, yep. the only other thing I'll say in terms of pipeline, I know mm -hmm. that's an area we're going to be doing a fair amount of outreach as well uh, this summer because with the adoption of the dip we moved, uh, roughly speaking, a dozen projects mm -hmm. or so from the pipeline onto the tip. So we'll be looking to refill that pipeline uh, by the time we get to another tip cycle. Right? Yes. 
All right. Projects in development. Yeah. All right. Uh, Nate or any of the district, Ray, anybody that wants to offer any uh, project updates? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first here. Um, then I'll pass it to Ray if he has anything. Pro I'll probably cover really projects in development and then really a status report all in one here. Um, so right now, today, um, the Dairy Street Improvements Project is out on the uh, PennDOT District 8 public, uh, public meetings website. Um, today is the last day uh, for, for public comment, at least with, to be able to view the plans and everything that are currently out there. Uh, so if you have a chance, jump on over to our website and uh, provide comment there. Uh, the South Bridge project. Um, so we're, we're nearing the end of the uh, preliminary engineering and working towards environmental clearance. Uh, but part of that environmental clearance process, we do have the public hearing part of it that uh, looking to hold here, hopefully by the end of May. Um, so just, uh, you know, we'll provide, provide information as it comes out when that public hearing uh, will take place. So that way everyone knows about it from the committee, but there will be, um, you know, advertisement for that uh, when, whenever we have the date set for, for that public comment. Um, just a couple other quick projects that are in the program. Uh, the Cameron McClay intersection project. Uh, we do, we have a survey started for that. Um, so we have the resurfacing that's being funded through our maintenance funds. And then we have the, the intersection project at Cameron and McClay that that's funded through, through the tip. So, uh, you know, good coordination of our, our funding allocations there from the tip and from county maintenance uh, to help move that project forward. Um, right now too, with the uh, Riverlands project, uh, discussing with FHWA, the, I'll say the level of effort for the environmental process. Um, there's discussions of the Riverlands portion potentially going to an EA, uh, but that's yet to be determined. Uh, if it does move to an EA environmental assessment, um, it would essentially uh, push that let date out even further for that project. Um, but that right now it's a significant project in the eyes of FHWA. So uh, they will have that determination on the environmental effort that is needed. Uh, if we do move to environmental assessment, uh, we will probably uh, split out the Clarks Ferry Bridge project uh, again from the Riverlands just because we could deliver that project sooner uh, and make some of the improvements that are part of the Riverlands uh, uh, as part of that project. So uh, I'll, hopefully by the next meeting, I'll be able to provide you a, a finite decision on the environmental process that we'll need to go through. Um, other than that, I'll take any questions if there's questions on specific projects. And if I don't have answers, I can get them to you after the meeting. Hey, Anything this is a, yeah, Nate, this is Kirk. I, I think I got an email yesterday that indicated there's an updated cost for the Southbridge project, the 850 million to 1 billion is the estimated cost now. Yeah, that is because we moved the viaduct, which is it's a, a bridge right next to the South Bridge. So the viaduct portion uh, is now included in the South Bridge. Um, again, you know, the funding is yet to be determined on how that portion will be funded, whether it would be included in the toll or uh, some other funding source. But right now, that is why the cost went up for, for the South Bridge project. Okay, yeah, that's a good clarification because the email I, I received said that you know the anticipated toll was still going to be a dollar to two dollars. So I was just kind of curious as you know, project nearly doubled in cost, yet the toll remains the same. Was was just interesting. So I guess we'll we'll wait and see how that works out. Then if the viaduct is is uh, funded using other mechanisms. Correct. Thanks for the question, Kirk. Yep. Thanks, Nate. Anything else for Nate? All right, in 
in terms of, uh, um, you know, whether it's project and development or status report, I'll ask Ray if he has anything uh, to add for the group. Sure, I can though, Steve. Um, thanks a lot there. I know from a 2023-2026 tip side of things there and and in regards there to um, AQ, of course, I know that AQ is such a important part here of the um, tip and it's one part there that is key. Um, so just last week, uh, we did share the um, highway bridge tip and the uh, CATS transit tip there with the ICG group are there to review all of the significant jobs and exempt jobs as part of the draft tip. Um, I actually look here to get those approved though soon. It is about a two week timing frame. You know, once that is approved there, we can then complete though with the consultant on board, the analysis report and we, we would then share that though with the NPPO there. So that is my update. Anybody have any questions for Ray? Thanks, Ray. Any, any further PennDOT uh, comment in terms of status report? Hearing none, I do not believe we have any uh, State Transportation Commission representation today so i'll move to federal highway i do believe gene's on the line gene do you have any comment or update for us yeah uh, thanks steve um back on uh, march 22nd last month uh usdot released a uh notice of funding opportunity for what's being called the multimodal projects discretionary grant which uh, is combining uh, three major usdot discretionary programs the mega infra and rural surface transportation grant programs. Um, I will drop some links in the chat uh, to the press release and the grant programs website, as well as to the NOFO itself, which uh, I would just say that it is a very lengthy document. Uh, so take some time if you really wanna dive into that. I believe it's like 94 pages for the NOFO. Um, and applications will be due on uh, May 23rd for these uh, grants. Okay. That's a big one, Gene. <laughs> yes, it is. Any Anyone have any questions or comments for Gene on that? Uh, Steve, maybe not for Gene, maybe just broader question. With all the infrastructure needs we have uh, in our region, have we ever applied for some of these big uh, federal infrastructure grants and, and tried to pull down some of the, the federal money to address some of our needs here? I'm not aware that any, you know, you, you ask, have we ever done it? I'm, I'm not aware that we have in the past. You know, this is a real, and Gene can maybe comment on this, but this is a real evolving uh, thing at this point. I think this is the, the first of the competitive grant periods that has been really released. There's a lot of other ones in the, in the process that are upcoming. So we are I will say this, we are trying to stay on top of it um, to look for opportunities and then to coordinate with the department on it. But I don't think historically, to my knowledge, um, ATS has ever done a competitive grant. Now, uh, I know the, the, only, the only other thing he mentioned, it's a combination of some old pro projects. I know the city went after at one point a Tiger grant for the Division Street Bridge so I think there may have been some applications, you know, from municipalities or others uh, in the past, but not on behalf of ACT. Would you see an opportunity for like the I-81 strategy of potentially a multi-MPO type application? For, yeah, for some, I'm thinking like Rays and, and some of the other ones that are out there that, you know, that it's such a huge freight corridor that has national significance. And if we get together on that, potentially pulling down some of the federal funds to alleviate the need then of funding through IM or, or other sources here. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's a great example of an, of an opportunity there. Timing for this round, I think Gene mentioned a May uh, timeframe, you know, that's, that just coincides with when we're finishing up the 81. So I, I don't see an application this year 
Uh, but I do in future years, once we've had a chance to coordinate and agree on the priority of what would be, uh, you know, what part of the 81 uh, strategy might make the best, most competitive grant application. I think that's a great example of how we intend to try to take advantage of some of those programs in the future. All right, thanks, Steve. Sure. Any other questions on, uh, I do see that Gene added the a link in the chat box. I have it up on the screen. So appreciate that information, Gene. Yes, yeah, Steve, just one, one more thing. Um, they do kind of break it out a little bit into categories. Like the, the mega program is, is basically for projects greater than $100 million. Um, then infra um, has some like minimums like for what they're terming a large project, the grant must be at least for 25 million and small projects must be at least 5 million under the, uh, under the infra designation. Okay. And then they're taking like 25% of the uh, funding for the rural is gonna be for uh, designated routes on the Appalachian highway system. Okay. Yeah. And Gene, I'll just ask a favor moving forward, you know, who, who knows what the timing is for some of these other announcements that you'll see. If, if you do come across this and it just happens to be not when there's a, uh, a HATS meeting coming up, if you wouldn't mind if you can share that information with us, we can spread it around to the committees uh, to get those conversations going. That would be helpful. Sure, absolutely. I'd be happy to do that, Steve. All right, appreciate that. With that, I'll move down to regional partners. Kat, I know Beth, I believe, is on the line. I don't know, Beth, if you have any uh, comments or updates for us. Yeah, I'm on the line, but I don't have anything to update for this meeting. Okay, thank Except you. Except that, like, all of our tip stuff is done. There you go. There you go. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yep. Did you hear? <laughs> I heard. Okay. Uh, Oh, I see uh, Mr. Epstein raised his hand again. So Eric, I'll ask if you have any, uh, you know, I don't know if it was on one of these updates or what your comment is. It's just an observation, but I can save it for other business. I just had a real quick okay. question. Okay, we'll catch you here in a second. Um, I don't believe we have Sarah Norfolk uh, Southern Amtrak or PMTA participation. I, I do believe we may have had a, a turnpike uh, person that registered for today. I don't know uh, if you're on, if you have any comments from the turnpike side or not. This is Pam Hess. I am a new employee of the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission, and I am just on just to observe and learn. And futuristically, okay. um, I will be willing to um, participate a little bit more, but at this point in time, I'm just going to take back any questions and concerns. And we are also looking at the um, grant that is out there on the federal side. So um, we can actually, you know, communicate better in the future on this as well. So happy to be here today and really enjoying the conversation. Yeah, really, really appreciate you uh, participating. Ben. We would welcome you to any of these uh, future meetings to keep that communication up. Really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. SRTP, I do believe we have SRTP participation as well. Yes, hi Steve. Um, I'm Stacy with uh, Computer Services of Pennsylvania. So just a couple quick things, a recap of our March. Our staff is actually out doing some on-site events, which is really great. So during March, we had 190 new commuters who actually enrolled in our Commute PA Rideshare and Reward um, database, which is more than double what we had in February. Um, we had over 5,000 green trips that were tracked during March, 61 tons of CO2 that were reduced and over 146,000 miles that were taken off the roads. And then the last two things, which I'm gonna post some links in the chat, we have our 2021 performance measurement marketing piece that just talks about the overall data from 2021. We break down the, the miles reduced, the emissions, the green trips tracked by mode. So I'll put that in the chat. We also have hard copies of that. If anyone is interested, you know, you can let me know or let Steve know, we can get them out to you. And then the other piece I'll post is we do these MPO one sheets pertaining to each MPO region. So we have one for Tri-County that talks about 2021 in general. It goes over some stats of commuter data within 
the counties um, of Cumberland, Dauphin, and Perry, and then some specifics from some of the employers within those um, areas as well. That's all that I have. Uh, anybody have any questions for Stacy? All right, th thanks, Stacy. Appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Uh, don't think we have anyone from DCED that I remember or, or DCNR, but I will just note in terms of DCNR that that's who we applied to for some funding to support that active transportation plan that uh, Andrew was talking about earlier. Um, with that legislators reports, I believe we have at least one uh, legislator representative today. I don't know if you have anything anything to report from a legislative perspective. Uh, nothing at this time, Steve. Thanks anyway. All right. All right. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. And then local reports. Uh, I know Jeff Knight uh, jumped on. Jeff, do you have anything to report from the city's perspective? Uh, not much uh, from, <clears throat> from the city's perspective. Uh, I want to thank everybody for the vote on the uh, uh, Capital Gateway project. Uh, that will certainly be transformative uh, for that intersection uh, here in the city and improve safety uh, for all users. Um, and um, yeah, just uh, really appreciate that. Uh, we've begun milling uh, Second Street uh, for the Second Street two-way conversion. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what the time frame for the project is as far as uh, new paving and lining, but I believe the project's supposed to be uh, finalized uh, sometime this year, uh, actually. So um, uh, that'll be a, a huge change uh, for that corridor and uh, kind of will dovetail in nicely with the uh, Capital Gateway project. All right. Anyone have any questions for Jeff? Jeff, I'll just say we'll be back in touch uh, as we start through this bike uh, share uh, initiative. Sounds good. All right. Other municipalities, I remember Aaron Trone coming on. There may be some other uh, municipal representatives. Anyone that has anything to share for the good of the committee? I don't really have anything to share at this time, but thank you. All right. Any others? Hearing none, I'll move to counties and I'll, I'll start with Gary E.B. Anything from a Perry County perspective you want to share or Jim Turner? I really don't have anything except the uh, bridge project at uh, 34 and 22, 322 is in full swing. Um, and there's a project on Route 34 that has been problematic that's been stalled over the winter. But uh, uh, we're, we're hoping that uh, that continues to move forward um, with uh, that and the repaving, which is, uh, that road is certainly deteriorating very quickly. But uh, it appears to me that things are moving along as fast as they're able to. Okay. All right, and I know we're coming up, is it next week, Gary, to talk uh, commuting issues with the Penn State uh, folks as well? I think that might be an interesting exercise. Uh, I look very much forward to that. And uh, the person that was just on there from the carpooling thing, would you make sure she yeah, uh, I, is aware of that? I, it's just I, something that dawned on me. Yeah, I, I actually spoke to Matt Boyer yesterday. Okay, great. At the end of the day yesterday about that to make sure they were aware. So that they will be Zoom participants that day. Gary. Yeah, that's fabulous. Um, and I, I thank you in advance for the high level cooperation we're receiving from that. And uh, I think it's something worth exploring and uh, to build some data. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. Just as a FYI, that's, uh, I guess there's some research dollars out there as part of this infrastructure uh, investment going forward. And Penn State had reached out to uh, Perry County, uh, offering to do some research on addressing the commuter needs uh, in the county, you know, maybe tying the park and ride in the, in the future or other ways of uh, addressing that need. So that's, this is an initial discussion next week um, to see, you know, where that might go. So it does look like an interesting opportunity. Um, with that, I'll move down to uh, Cumberland County, Mr. Stoner. Do you Bruce. have anything else to add? 
Sure, thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah, just like to report, uh, we recently let uh, a bridge bundle project that includes three county owned bridges. And that's really a landmark for the county. That's our, our last bridge uh, package of bridges for our, our bridge capital improvement program. So we started that back in 2015. Uh, we made a, a commitment with the commissioners to deliver $40 million worth of projects in, in six years. Uh, and we did that. So we're very proud of the, the success we've had. Uh, we're thankful to our commissioners who really put up a big vote for the $5 local use registration fee, which is the backbone of that program. So now that that program's completed, now we're moving on to look at what other needs there are in the county. The commissioners uh, voted back in January to retain that fee to potentially be used for other projects. So we've been working with our municipalities to look at poor condition bridges that are over 20 feet in length that the county inspects on their behalf as part of our uh, National Bridge Inspection Standard contract that we have with PennDOT. So we've identified six poor condition bridges that we'd like to, to move ahead uh, using our, our $5 fee, working with the municipalities to explore a potential uh, cost sharing situations. But I think that the issue we're running into and a request I'd, I'd like to make of, of the group today, uh, with the new 2023 tip, I, I realize there's a local bridge line item on there. I believe it starts in 2024 for construction. We're very thankful for that. Uh, it's $1 million per county per year. Uh, very, again, very thankful for that. But as we look at it, I think we're going to need more money uh, in Cumberland County. And was just wanted to request to the group, is, is there an opportunity for the HAT staff to work with PennDOT to identify, are there any other local bridge funding opportunities out there that could be brought to bear for these local bridges? We are seeing a lot of need. I'm looking at our need. We're about uh, $7.5 million over those six bridges. And some of those may go up or down, some of those may fall out, but it's still, it's representative of the need that we've seen. I believe Dauphin County is in a similar situation. Uh, you know, I'll let them speak for themselves, but uh, I think it's, it's a big need that we've seen. Uh, we recognize there's money out there. So it would be something I'd like to request if there's, there's another look that could be taken into that. We're happy to work with, uh, you know, HATS and, and others to try and use our local funding to, to maybe do some pre-engineering pre work or uh, pre-construction work to get these bridges to a point where they're ready for construction. So uh, again, I know Dolphin, Perry County, what, what their thoughts are, if that, that would be something they're seeing similar need in their counties. And Kirk, I'll just say a few words and then I'm gonna give Nate a chance to respond. Um, you know, when we put that line item on, I, I think it was uh, done because we recognized the need as you're indicating, but didn't have that quantified yet. Um, you know, and didn't know status of where different municipalities might be in terms of design, uh, you know, work or that kind of thing. So I, I think we always anticipated that there would be some change in that number you know, once we knew more uh, about where, where we were heading, what the demand was. But um, so I, I, I think we expected it to unfold that way. But with that, I will ask if Nate um, wants to offer any thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I mean, when it comes down to this next tip, uh, you know, over the next few months here, well, in October, when it takes effect, we'll be identifying any, you know, changes that we need to make based on cash flow and, you know, letting program. And once those adjustments are done, uh, we can start taking a look at uh, funding that may be available uh, for local bridges to potentially advance uh, some of that local funding bridge line item. Um, so it's, it's really the, the dance of the cash flow that we'll be doing here between October and December. And then, you know, as everyone knows that the tip's a living document, we can add projects to it at any time, you know, with committee approval. So uh, I, I think right now it's, uh, we have to see how things shake out with, with the funding whenever it takes effect and we have, you know, clean up those, the funding scenarios that we have to do for each project here late, late in the year. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. And, you know, I just ask as you're going through that, if you need specifics from us as to where we're at and what projects we believe we could deliver, you know, in that time frame, we're, we're more than willing to work with you to give you that information. Okay. That one, I guess, Steve, with that, would they be submitting essentially the needs through the project pipeline then? I, th I think that's probably how we'll, how we'll do that, uh, Nate. Uh, okay. That's what I'm anticipating at this point. Okay. And, and with that, I'll only add um, that, uh, you know, Mr. Eby, since you're on the phone, this is the other 
subject we wanted to discuss with you when we come up to have that Penn State conversation. Yeah, that's right. Steve, I'd like to provide a little input on that if I could. Go ahead, Jim. Thank you. Um, our county engineer has identified a little over $13 million worth of construction cost estimates for these local bridges in poor condition. And, and listening to what, not anticipating what might happen without, but in the future, I think what, what Kirk is proposing is, is a way for us to make sure that we're going to get these bridges which create safety hazard. We're trying to eliminate that safety hazard, hazard so we've got a, a more safer local road network. Um, to get these, these, these bridges planned, budget, budgeted, and, and constructed you know, in, in a timely manner and in, in a coordinated manner. And uh, therefore, I think what, what Kirk's proposing is we, his request be followed through with uh, and maybe something through the, to the coordinating committee, maybe that's where we go next, so that we keep this active and moving. Yeah, no, appreciate that, Jim. And I, again, I think, I think that's definitely where we're headed, trying to quantify the demands and the schedule and, uh, you know, the various comparative needs between these bridges and figure out a... Uh, you know, the most logical way to move this forward and then work with the district on, on how we can, uh, you know, how, how quickly we'll be able to do that with the available fund. So I think this is a subject that probably under projects under development or that type of thing um, that we'll be updating the group with on a regular basis. Kirk, Mike, I'm just kind of curious, is that, are you satisfied with it? Sure. You know, it sounds like there's there's some other issues we have to work through here with the 2023 tip before you know any any realistic expectations can be made of what funding would be available. But I think between Dolphin, uh, Cumberland, and Gary too, and Perry County, I'm not sure if you have quantified you know what your needs may be. You know, between the three counties, if we get together, can figure that out. That could probably give PennDOT and others guidance of what a realistic level may look like to to make some impact. Well, we're transit we're transitioning with another engineering group. And we'll be getting an update uh, this month uh, with that, and we'll have a better uh, uh, view of just exactly what our needs are. Um, but they 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 are acute. There's no doubt about it. Right. Okay. I, I'm gonna I'm looking at raised hands, and one of the raised hands I see is Brian Ember, and I I'm going to assume Brian wants to add some additional information to this discussion. So I I'll ask Brian if you want to share your comments. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, we we, uh, we do have, uh, we are prepared with uh, lists of the bridges in uh, Dauphin and um, Cumberland County. I realize those probably weren't available when as quickly as the tip had to be updated, but uh, we're prepared with uh, lists and, and ready to run projects through uh, the pipeline uh, as required. And, and actually we have a list uh, from two years ago in Perry County. So we've got a good start on that if Gary, if you, if you want that. So uh, we, we're ready to jump on that when, uh, whenever we're asked to do it. Okay. Kirk, you raised this as part of the, your Cumberland County input. Do you have any other issues you wanna to bring to the group or was that the main thing? Yeah, I think that's enough for today, Steve. Thanks. Uh, all right. <laughs> well, then with that, I'll I'll ask Mr. Libhart. I believe he's on uh, for Dauphin County. If you have anything uh, in addition that you would like to offer, I don't have anything additional to add. I think Dauphin County would echo the uh, the suggestion and 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 offer our support for what what Kirk is suggesting. So I'd like to like to see where we end up with that. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, so I think if I go back to the agenda, that's everything under status reports. I think that moves us to other business. So I think I will now circle back um, with Mr. Epstein. I believe you said this is where you might have something to add. I j just have a question. It may be fundamental, but I noticed that East uh, Hemfield and PennDOT uh, have a study under, uh, underway at Lidditch Road and Route 72 relating to um, the number of fatalities they've had recently. And I was just not aware that there was a warning treatment program. Is that something that we do 
uh, in this region? And if it is, uh, what's the tipping point to facilitate a warning treatment study at intersection? Um, I'm not familiar with that exact terminology, Eric. So I have to look into that. I, I will say that we do have a fairly extensive kind of safety planning and analysis. We're just wrapping up some of the work uh, that we've been doing here recently to try to identify, you know, in addition to that HSIP analysis that Andrew was telling you about earlier, um, we will, uh, you know, we're, we're continually focusing on areas of, of the highest safety need uh, in the region. So I will say that, but I'll, I'll just say that in, on that, you know, the specific um, terminology that you're using there, I'm going to have to look into that and get back to you. Yeah, I just never heard of a 30, that's a 30 day program, something that quick from PennDOT in response to a fatality. So it, maybe it's a novel term, but I thought certainly something we could look at. Okay. We'll look into it. Thank you. Does anyone have anything else uh, under other business to share? Uh, I got one thing from Mr. Baumberger. I'll just let everyone know last last meeting I mentioned uh, the annual report is up for review. It's been posted to our website. So if you're if you're interested, feel free. Okay. Anyone have any other other business? Hey, hey, Steve. Just uh, wanted to provide quick response to the the seventy two and let it's. Um, I th I think you might be referring to you know a municipality can request a a review of an intersection so. You know our traffic section. You would you would send a request into our district traffic engineer, uh, and they would do uh, that an warning analysis treatment. Uh, you know whatever you're requesting, whether it be signage or flashing beacons, they right. they'll do their analysis on that and provide you know if if it's an appropriate treatment, uh, where it would be placed and everything um, through the normal process at the district. Thank you. I don't really think you need to follow up any further on that. That's I appreciate right. your response. So it's so Nate, it's kind of like an RSA request, something like that. Yeah, similar to that. Uh, similar to you know, at an intersection, if someone's requesting a you know a signal be uh, analyzed, if if you know a signal should be installed at an intersection, our traffic section will look at that uh, and provide you. that information back. So similar type of concept. Right. I okay. just never heard the term. That's the only reason I was. Yeah. Aware. Okay. All right. Hearing no other business, you see that our next meeting is scheduled for June 11th. So with that, I will ask for a motion for adjournment. Just a point of correction. I, oh. I think that should be the 10th. Oh, is that right? Uh, Hold on a second. There we go. Yeah, we're not going to do it on Saturday morning, Gary. Appreciate that. I would like that day off. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. <laughs> with, with special thanks to Mr. Eby, I will then ask for that motion for adjournment. Mm -hmm. So move. So move. Uh, I, I'll second, get Ray. Ray Green. And, uh, is it, was there a second? I missed that. I'll second that. Gary. There we go, Gary. Thank you. With that, we shall stand adjourned. See you on June 10th. Great meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.